Proxmox is one of the best platforms for running virtual machines and containers at home. But if you're new, getting everything set up can be a bit overwhelming. In this video, I'll walk you through everything you need to know to install, configure, and start using Proxmox. This is a beginner's guide focused on teaching you the fundamentals so you can build on a solid foundation without getting lost in the complexity. I truly believe that when you're getting into virtualization, the best approach is to start simple and scale up. So that's the angle that this video will take. So what I did is I flashed a USB drive with the Proxmox installer. If you aren't sure exactly how to do that, I've written instructions that will walk you through that process in the description, and then you'll pick up from here. So we are going to run through the installer at this point, and then basically it will install Proxmox to our boot drive, and then we can start to use it. So I'm gonna use the graphical installer, and then I will agree to the terms, and then this is where we start. So in the hard disk section here, what you're going to see is everything that you currently have plugged into your device. For me, I will be installing it on this NVMe drive, and if you click into the options here, what you'll see is the different file system types that you can use. For this setup, I'm just going to use ext4, but let's say you had multiple hard drives and you wanted to have redundant boot drives. What you do is come in here and you could use either ZFS with RAID 1 or BTRFS with RAID 1. For most people, you're probably not going to have that, so you can realistically select ext4, but if you do have two boot drives, you can use ZFS or BTRFS. So we are gonna click okay here. We will move on to the next step. We will fill out our country and time zone, give it a password and our email address. And then in the management interface section, you're going to see all of the network interfaces that you currently have plugged in. So this device has two, we're gonna talk about that a little later, but I'm just gonna use the first one here, give it a name, and then we're gonna give it an IP address. So for me, I know the subnet that this device is plugged into is 10.2.40. So I gave it an IP address of 10.2.40.150. What's important to highlight here is that this will ensure that Proxmox will continue to use that IP address, but that does not necessarily mean that your DHCP server, which is on your router, will not hand out that IP address to a different device. So realistically, what you wanna do is you wanna set a DHCP reservation as well. I'll talk through that in a second here. But once that's done, we're gonna select next. And then at this point, it will show all of our information and we can then install it. Okay, so once the installer finishes, we are going to reboot this. And when it boots back up, you'll see this screen and that means that we can then go and access it from a web browser. So I'm going to access it by the IP address and port and what you will see is we'll be brought to this screen because it has a self-signed certificate. We will accept the risk and continue, and then we will be brought to Proxmox. Now, what I mentioned earlier is that we really want to set up a DHCP reservation as well. This will change depending on exactly what type of router you're using, but in a unified network, you can just select the device itself, go to the gear icon, and set a fixed IP address. This will ensure that the DHCP server, which is most people's routers, will not attempt to hand out this IP address to another device. Not something that you necessarily have to do, but definitely a best practice. So with that out of the way, we can log in with the root user and the password that you set up and you will be brought to the main screen of Proxmox. So we're gonna click through this and then there are a few things that we have to do. Now the very first thing that you have to do is ensure that you're able to get updates. So I installed an older version so that I could show you the update process. But what we're going to do is we are going to use a script to do this. Now, it's best to always ensure that you know exactly what a script is doing. And you don't have to do it this way. If you really want to, you could go in and manually change everything that the script does automatically. But the main thing we're looking to do is add the no subscription repository. So what that will do is it will allow you to go in and get updates for Proxmox. Now the enterprise version, which requires a license that you have to pay for, has updates that have already been tested. The no subscription repository doesn't. So it's really designed for testing environments and homes. Now I have not ever run into any problems, but that does not necessarily mean that you'll never run into any problems. It's just something to be aware of. But in order to get updates, we have to do this. 
So I'm not going to do it this way, but if you wanted to, you could come in here, add the no subscription repository, and then you would come in here and disable the enterprise repositories. And that would ensure that you're able to then update the system. Rather than doing that, I'm going to run the Proxmox post install script from the Proxmox helper scripts. These are very, very powerful. A lot of people use them and they allow you to do a lot of things without really having to do anything. And ultimately it's the exact same process that we're going to run here, but it just will ask you slightly different questions. And you can install a lot of different things and they'll set up either virtual machines or Linux containers, but very, very powerful. We're not going to do any of that. All we're going to do is copy this post install script, head back to the Proxmox and the shell. We will paste that in and then we are going to run this. So this is going to ask you if you want to run the post install script. We do. The first thing it will ask is if you want to use the correct sources. That's what we just went over. We do want to do this. Do we want to disable the enterprise repository? Yes, we do. Do we want to enable the no subscription repository? Yes, we do. Ceph is an advanced feature. Most people are not going to be using Ceph, but if you are and you want to correct the Ceph packages, you can. For me, I'm not going to. Same thing with the test repository and then the subscription nag. So the subscription nag is what you've seen as we've been navigating through Proxmox. It'll ask you to buy a license and just inform you that you don't currently have a license. Proxmox is great software. And if you're using this in an enterprise environment, I would highly suggest that you do pay the license fees. If you do want to get rid of that nag, you can do it this way. But again, I would recommend that you support the Proxmox team. So I'm going to disable it. They will highlight why you should support the team. And then it will talk to you about high availability. If you only intend on using this one node only, you can disable high availability. If you don't, and you think that this will grow at some point, you can leave it enabled. It's up to you. And finally, it will ask you to update Proxmox. I'm going to select no, because I wanna show you the manual way of doing this, but you should reboot Proxmox as soon as you finish this. So we will select yes. So with the system rebooted, if we head back to the repositories, what you will see is that the enterprise repositories have been disabled and the no subscription repository has been enabled. So that will allow us to install updates. So if we head back to the update section and select refresh, you will see all of the updates that can be installed. You can then upgrade the system. So we'll run through and it will ask you if you want to continue, we do, and then all of the updates will be installed. Now you will periodically have to do this. How often you do it is up to you, but you should always keep your system up to date. Okay, so the updates have all been installed. So we're going to head back to Proxmox and we're just gonna reboot the system. And with Proxmox back up, you will see we're now on version 8.4.1. So Proxmox has been installed. We've ran the helper script to remove the nag, update the repositories, and then we updated the system and that's where we are right now. So the next thing I'd recommend is that you set up your storage. So by default, your boot drive will set up a local LVM storage space where you can install virtual machines and Linux containers. Now, if you had an additional drive, what you could do is head to the data center, then head to storage, and you can create a new storage location. Depending on the type of drive that you want to use and exactly what you want to do, that would determine if you wanted to use LVM or ZFS, et cetera. And the real goal of this storage is just to be able to install virtual machines and Linux containers on that. So your boot drive would be for the Proxmox operating system. The additional drive would then be for virtual machines and Linux containers. Not everybody will have multiple disks in their device. If you don't, you really don't have to do this. But what I would recommend is that if you have a NAS, I'd recommend that you connect your Proxmox server to your NAS. And I'd recommend using NFS for this. So what you could do is inside of this storage location, you can select NFS. And then what you can do is come in here and set up NFS storage space. So I'm going to use my UNAS Pro and this is the IP address of my UNAS Pro. And then on my UNAS Pro, what I did is I came in here and I created a new NFS connection from this IP address. So 10.2.40.150, that's the IP address of our Proxmox server. I'm giving it read write permissions to a shared folder on this NAS named Proxmox and then I can add it. As soon as I do that, I can come in here, select the drop-down list, and then select my Proxmox folder that I just shared, 
and then we can add this. So at this point, the NFS share is set up. There's one thing I forgot to mention, and it's really that you have to select the type of content. I'm going to select everything here, and then I'm gonna select okay. So with that set up, what we can do is we can add a backup schedule. I do this first because it ensures that then anything I do and set up in the future will automatically be backed up. So in the backup section, I'm going to select add. I'm going to set the schedule as every day at, we'll say 12 o'clock. Then what I'm going to do is change this to all. And then in the storage location, you have to make sure you select your NAS. This is assuming that you have a NAS. But what I'll be doing is on a nightly basis, I'll be backing up all of my virtual machines and Linux containers to my UNAS Pro. The only other thing to change is the retention policy. I'll set this to 30. We will select create. And then at this point, I know that every single Linux container and virtual machine will automatically be backed up. The other thing it allows us to do is it allows us to upload ISO images directly to our NAS rather than having to use storage on Proxmox itself. So you can download ISOs for virtual machines that you want to install, and then you could come here and upload them basically as simple as this, and it will upload it directly to your NAS. Those are the two biggest benefits of following this approach. So what you'll see here is that I have a few ISO images for virtual machines that I can install. And what we're going to do is we're just going to set up a basic Ubuntu server. So if we head back to the PVE tab, I'm going to create a new virtual machine. So I'm going to give it a name. The VM ID is whatever you'd like to use. Normally what I do is I try and match the static IP address of this virtual machine with the VM ID, but that's up to you. Then what we can do is in the storage location, we can select the UNAS Pro, and then we can go to that Ubuntu server, ISO image, select system. This is where you can run through and change any of the system settings in the disks section. If you had multiple storage locations that you set up in this drop down list here, you'd see multiple. As you can see, we could technically install it to the UNAS Pro, but I'm not going to do that. And this is the disk size. So I'll set this as 40 gigs. And then in the CPU section, I will change this to two cores. Just to mention the type can be important depending on the type of virtual machine you're setting up. For me, this is fine. But in the memory section, two gigs for now is fine. And then in the bridge section, if you had multiple network interfaces, you would go through and select whatever bridge you wanted to install this virtual machine on. For me, I'm going to keep things simple. So it's going to be VM bridge zero. This is your default bridge. This is where it will be installed. We can then select confirm and we are going to start this virtual machine. So we are going to install Ubuntu server. So at this point, I'm not going to bore you with this, but I'm just gonna run through and install Ubuntu server. So our Ubuntu virtual machine is now set up and I'm just running through the upgrade process. So now what we have to talk about is the QEMU guest agent. And the easiest way to think about this is it allows for easier communication between the Proxmox host and the virtual machine. In general, you want to install the guest agent. And depending on the operating system you're using, it's generally very easy. But if you scroll down to Linux here, what you'll see is all we have to do is run this one command. We'll talk about Windows in a second here, but what I'm going to do is I'm gonna copy this command, head back to Proxmox, and then I'm going to run that command, and it will run through and it will install the guest agent. So what you'll see is that in this options section here, the QEMU guest agent is currently disabled. So what we can do is we can edit this, select to use it, click OK, and then we have to reboot the system so that it gets these changes. So we will reboot the system and then it will be used. Now this will help with just about everything. For Linux, it's very simple. For Windows, it's a little different. So to use this for Windows, and a lot of the times, especially for Windows 11 virtual machines, you have to use this to install the drivers, very important. So you can click this Windows Vert IO driver section here, and then it will run through and basically show you how to do it. So you can download the latest stable ISO image, and then on whatever storage you have, you can upload it. So right now you'll see that I have it uploaded here. And the way that you would then use it is inside of your virtual machine, there is a section for a CD slash DVD. 
And then you would just come in here and rather than using the install media, you would select this, click OK. And then when you are inside of the virtual machine for Windows, you would see this ISO image and then you can run through and install it. If you want to install Windows 11 in a Proxmox virtual machine, I have instructions that I'll leave in the description of the video and it basically will walk you step by step. But that is how you can install and set up a virtual machine. And at this point, I can use this virtual machine for whatever I want. If I wanted to install Docker on it, I could. That's currently how I'm running Docker. I will leave an article for that in the description as well. But that is the basics of setting up a virtual machine. And like I said earlier, this virtual machine will automatically back up. Now, the next thing to talk about is Linux containers. And Linux containers are super, super powerful, but I feel like most people don't use them. They kind of jump straight to a virtual machine. And the benefit of Linux containers is really that you can share resources with the host. So compared to a virtual machine where you have to allocate specific resources to it, you don't have to do that with Linux containers. The difference is that you have to download the Linux container images. So you can do this on whatever storage you'd like. If you have a NAS, I'd recommend putting it there. But what you could do is in this template section, you can download a template for whatever Linux container you want to use. So I already downloaded Debian and Ubuntu. So what I'll do is I'll head back here and create a container, give it a host name and a password. In the template section, I will go through and I will select that Debian template. In the disk section, I'm going to just give it 20 gigs. CPU, I'll set it to two cores. Memory, I'll set it to a maximum of two gigs. And then in the network section, what's important here is that you have to make sure that you either select DHCP or set a static IP address, but I'm just going to use DHCP. DNS will use the host settings and then we will confirm it and we can start it. Now at this point, it will boot up. And if you have problems with the console, what you could do is in the options section here, you can change the console mode from default to dev slash console. And then you can reboot this. And once that's done, you can log in with the root user and the password that you set. And at that point, you can go through and you can do exactly what you have to do. Now, Linux containers will use significantly less resources. Some people love Linux containers. Some people hate them. One of the reasons why they hate them is because you kind of got to be careful about security. You're sharing resources with the host. So inside of the options section here, you're going to see that I set up an unprivileged container. What that means is that it does not have root permission, the container itself. Technically, when you create a container, you can uncheck this and it will then be a privileged container. When it's a privileged container, you gotta kinda be careful about security because again, it will have access to the host. So what you'll see is in an unprivileged container, you really only have a few options here. But if you wanted to use NFS or SMB, it has to be done in a privileged container. Now I say has to be, it has to be done in a privileged container if you want to do it by default. But there are ways to edit the configuration file for the Linux container and you can pass resources from the host to an unprivileged container. That's the way I'd recommend doing it. Advanced feature, overall something you have to look into, but rather than just setting up privileged Linux containers, look into that if that's a path you want to go down. Now, if you follow these steps, you should have a virtual machine or Linux container that's set up and accessible. But as I mentioned in the beginning, this is really just the start. I have two videos that I'd recommend that you watch. The first goes over new install Proxmox changes that you can make, so it will basically be exactly where you are now. So it's a perfect stepping stone from this video. The next is for a few advanced Proxmox changes which can be configured after you watch this video and the new install changes video. If you watch those and implement some, but maybe not all of the changes, you'll have a fully functional Proxmox setup that is extremely powerful. I know this was a lot, and the goal is really just to get you to a baseline of Proxmox so you can install virtual machines and Linux containers and start to configure them. But if you have any questions, please feel free to leave those in the comments. But other than that, if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.